you've been travelling a lot for work trips and you were in China, the US and Belgium too. How are the people and businesses there embracing digital transformation? I think uh, the US and China in many ways are emblematic of the change that's taking place. They're moving very fast in certain parts of the country by investing in technology, whether it's artificial intelligence and 5G-related work and so on. So there are the companies and the tech giants who are blazing the trail. And that's true in both these countries and in many other parts of the world. But at the same time, the rest of the country, the rest of the economy is also trying to digest this change and its implications for the companies and for the individuals and how they adapt to it. And we are in the same position. So what we always focus on is we shouldn't be thinking about the technology and the change just for the sake of the technology, but it's really about how it makes a difference in our lives for the better and how it also helps our companies and our economy stay competitive in the long term. So we have to start with a mindset change first. Absolutely. And also to recognise that whilst it poses challenges, it also presents opportunities and we need to be prepared on both sides. China got the jump on most countries uh, when it came to tech disruption. What were some of the more interesting observations from the time you spent in China? I think China has a unique advantage because uh, it's a country where they aggregate all the data. And when they put all the data together and then make it available to their companies, today, data is probably one of the most critical resources. The more data information I have, the more, whether it is an artificial intelligence software or some other you know, program, they can do much better. So that's one aspect where China has differentiated itself. But the other big thing in China is more than the money, it's the people, the talent that's going into this. So it is a, a country with a large population, and even if it's a fraction of the population, it's still a sizable number of people, very talented, who are involved in this sector. And you could make a similar observation about the US, although a lot of it is driven more from the private sector side. So for us, countries like Singapore, we are smaller, so we have to be smart about the way we play in this. We have to focus our efforts and make sure that we are deriving the best maximum possible benefits for our people and our economy. The Chinese are so connected on their mobile phones. Did you notice a lot of that, dur a lot of that during your travels there? Oh yeah, I met uh, many companies, uh, especially startups, very interesting. Um, I think mobile phone connectivity is one aspect of it. Uh, even in areas like robotics, I met a company called UB Tech. They are doing robots which can be used in not just uh, companies and business operations, but also in the home. And this is no longer the stuff of science fiction. Actually, it's happening and you can see a lot of the improvements. And what you see today in six months, one year, they've vastly improved the product. So it's a major effort in China. And again, uh, China has the same challenge because this sort of development and advancement is taking place in certain areas, but they have a vast country and there are many Chinese citizens who also need to be brought into it. It's more than just, you know, uh, shopping in Alibaba or, or watching videos. You have to now start to think about how people are productively using the technology and also enabling them to live better lives and also enhance their careers. If you look at Singapore as well, because we're small, we're more nimble, we're more flexible, and it's easy for us to adapt to digital technology. Hmm. Indeed. So I think uh, one of the things I emphasize to many is that small is not necessarily a liability and in fact it can be a major advantage. And the reason is because by, being, by virtue of being a small country, A, we're able to bring the relevant parties together very quickly around a strategy and execute it. And that is even more relevant today because change is happening so fast and, you know, we're all trying to keep up. So the more quickly we can bring the businesses and the unions and the government parties together and say, look, we got to deal with this and this is the way forward, let's all pull together, the better off we will be. So I think that's one big advantage. The other advantage is from a regulation point of view, we're also able to be more nimble because a lot of these new technologies require governments to be smarter in the way they regulate. If you take fintech, for example, you know, every time a new fintech company comes on, it's got a great idea. But, you know, if it's going to disrupt the financial 
system, uh, every central bank regulator is going to be very nervous about it. So what we are able to do is because of the kind of country that we are and the regulatory system that we have, we create these little sandboxes. Say, okay, we can try this out in a limited way, test it out, understand it before it can be adopted at the nationwide level. And that's why you have solutions like PayNow, which now makes a huge difference in the lives of millions of Singaporeans because you have, you know, in the past, individual banks had their own payment solutions and so on. But now everybody can transact with one another using this PayNow platform, which was brought together because the regulator, in this case, MAS, brought everyone together. When it comes to digital transformation of our small companies and the bigger ones too, and you said our advantage of being a small nation is there, does it make nationwide digital transformation in Singapore easier because of that? It's both easier and more difficult, and, and equally difficult as other countries, I would say. Easier in the sense of reaching out, communicating and persuading people, I think in that sense, in terms of your ability to have an impact uh, from the point of view of reach, I think as a small country, it's easier. I mean, if you're in the US and you've got to reach out to your 50 states and all the different cities, it's so different. And same thing with China. But on the other hand, the challenge is the same because fundamentally, it's all about, as you said, changing mindsets. Because I can talk to a 100 business leaders, I can talk to you know, thousands of employees or workers. But at the end of the day, you have to have the spark, the decision that, yes, this is something that is important. We need to do something about this. And it's actually in our interest to make a change. Because once you have the spark, in other words, a mindset shift, then all the other things can be organized. But this is the main thing. And this is where I think our work with the enterprises, with the trade associations and chambers, with the labor movement has been very, very beneficial because I think they have come up and they've adopted the fact that this is something we need to do and it's in our interest to do it. And the question is how to make it, that transition, as productive and minimize the costs and the adjustment pains. Minister, I think we must be doing a lot of things right because Singapore has been rated the smartest city in the world according to the inaugural IMD Smart City Index. Uh, what do you think made us stand out? Yeah, so when we do these things, uh, you know, when we embark on these efforts, uh, these league tables are, are nice, uh, especially when you're, you're know, on the top of the heap or somewhere near the top. But Frankly, that's not our motivation. Our objective really is at the end of the day, and I go back to the point I made, it's not about tech for the sake of tech or smart nation for the state for the sake of being on the top of the league here. It's really about how it makes a difference for our citizens and how it makes a difference for our companies. So for our citizens, I gave the example of something like pay now. But we also have other initiatives like the My Info effort where you know, companies can do load up their information and then that information, they don't need to keep repeating it. Everybody can use it and so on, you know, and as long as there's uh, appropriate uh, permission given and so on. And we're doing something similar for individuals. So that's an example of how it makes a material difference in the lives of our people. And so I think that's a key focus. And also what we are doing is working, you know, like we have these SME Go Digital programs and things like that to help especially our small businesses and we have training programs especially to help our workers who may not have a tech background get onto this because actually it is within all our means to do this um, you know we shouldn't let this spook us in fact uh, you know you are you guys have made the transition in the media space i mean you're using so much more tech than you're used to and i think it's the same for everybody else as well and i think the main thing is to do away with the whole mystery of this demystify it and focus on practical steps on how we can make a change. And we're going to focus on Singapore's digital push next. Uh, how would you rate Singapore's efforts to become a smart nation so far then, sir? I think uh, I would say that, uh, you know, we are doing well in the sense that we have a clear direction, we have uh, policies in place. But I would describe this more as a journey than a destination because I think there's a lot of work that needs to be constantly done and the technology is changing around us. But the most important thing is once directionally we are clear and if everybody is on board 
And this is where we focus a lot of our effort over the last few years, persuading businesses, especially small businesses, and also persuading our large base of uh, workers and the unions that these are transitions that are in our best interest and we've got to work together to navigate this well. You know, how will the ICT, uh, that is Information and Communications Technology Workforce, be impacted should there be a, a more serious economic downturn compared to our other local industries? Mm. So this is an interesting point because uh, when we talk about, say, the Infocom media industry, there, there's a few dimensions to it. One is, of course, the those who are in the tech area themselves. So these are the tech companies. And then there are those who are doing the ICT, ICM jobs, but in the non-tech areas. But when you aggregate all of this, actually what we find is the ICM sector in Singapore has been one of the more resilient ones over this whole last several years. So, for example, between 2016 to 2018, we have had an annualized nominal growth rate of about 8.2% in the ICM sector, which is actually quite a strong growth rate. Uh, the total employment in the sector is uh, well over 200,000. And what we see is there's a continuing demand. In fact, the job creation in this sector is one of the strong parts. So what we want to do is see how we can get, and there's a global shortage of such talent. So what we want to do is make sure that Singaporeans are able to fully benefit from this, which is why the emphasis on the skills framework for ICT and why we are updating it and enhancing it to include some of the newer tech areas around AI, around 5G, around Internet of Things, and also data protection and so on. The idea here really is there are new areas emerging. Companies need them. Both tech companies and non-tech companies need such uh, capabilities. Uh, and therefore, how do we help them? So, for example, if you're an online shopping outfit, uh, I run a very big outfit, but I need people who can do data analytics. I need people who can advise me on data protection and so on. And they need not all be people who have come from a pure tech background. So I would say it's a sector that is holding up well and it offers us rich opportunities, which is in fact even more significant because when you talk about, earlier we discussed China and, and the US. One interesting thing about China and the US is they all see great opportunity, the companies from these countries, they see great opportunities in Southeast Asia. And they see Singapore as the launch point from which to address those opportunities. So we have actually got a, you know, the growth is there, the opportunities are being created. And we also have the potential to work with international companies who are coming to Singapore. So I would say the prospects are good, but we shouldn't be complacent and we have to work at making full use of it. But still, the government is encouraging more of us to enter the ICT workforce then. Um, I, so as I said, I think there's two two dimensions to it. One is people getting into the ICT uh, workforce itself. So whether it is, you know, in programming and, you know, data analytics or even cybersecurity and so on. But the other side, and I think this is the key point, it is every industry needs some kind of digital capability. So all of us, whatever the sector, you know, whether it is in media, whether it is in uh, manufacturing and so on, you do need that capability as well. So it's not necessarily all about getting into the tech industry, but it's about getting digital skills in the non-tech areas as well, because that is an important part of the transformation. Ancillary support departments, and also this has to be extended to our polys and institutions of higher learning too. Absolutely. So there's two dimensions. One is for students, whether it's in our ITs, our polytechnics and our universities, this digital education piece is a big part, both in the formal uh, you know, learning, but also in the internships and so on that they undertake, they pick up a lot of this. So I think they are coming into the workforce uh, well prepared with the exposure they get both from their formal curriculum and the internship. But the other side is actually the people who are already in the workforce, people like you and me. So we need to also pick up skills. So that's why we have things like what we call TESA, Tech Skills Accelerator Program. Basically, a range of causes, a range of programs Calibrated, so depending on what level of tech we are in, how do we get up to the next level and make the transitions that are necessary? And this is an important part of the work because whilst we can focus on students, 
the vast majority of Singaporeans are in the workforce and we've got to work on helping this group make that transition. Well, recently you announced that there will be 5G coverage over half of Singapore by yeah. the year 2022. Uh, just to make a comparison, uh, 5G will be uh, 20 to 100 times faster uh, than 4G? Yes, it'll be 20 times or so faster. Theoretical maximum mm -hmm. speeds, yes, much faster. And uh, can you tell us how our lives will change with 5G? So, you know, when you talk about all these technologies, it's always a little bit esoteric. You know, everybody wonders, what does 5G mean exactly and how it's going to make a difference? So, think But we do it. know about the downloading speeds. That's exactly right, <laughs> you see. So, so people start with that, you know, how quickly you can download a video that you yeah. want to watch or a movie. And, you know, so 5G, obviously, you're going to be able to download your videos a lot faster than if you're doing it in 4G. But that's not our motivation, actually, for doing this. Although, from the, for the average consumer, you see, because 5G means uh, you can have much higher data flow rates, it also means you can support a lot more sensors and devices, uh, you know, in, in locations. You can do, you know, a million devices, you know, and the intensity is so much higher. So all these things, it enables completely new areas. For consumers, downloads and the experience is one thing. Gaming is another big area people talk about, mobile gaming and so on. So that's why, say, Razer is working with uh, Singtel to to do one of these, uh, you know, what we call uh, end-use efforts, you know, end-user sort of uh, trials to see what we can do there. But actually, the more significant area is the impact it can have on industry and therefore what, uh, benefits we derive uh, as uh, you know people in the economy and in the country. So I give you an example. You know we talk about autonomous vehicles, but autonomous vehicles have got a lot of devices, and they need to talk to sensors, and they're processing information you know at incredible speeds because they need to know whether there's an obstacle, whether there's you know any hindrance that they need to avoid, etc. And so on. Now, if you want to do this. You, you need a mobile system like 5G, which allows much faster data flow and also what they call the latency. In other words, the lag between the time that you get the information to the time you can react and so on. So all of these things make a huge difference. So if you want to have a smarter transportation system, which will benefit all our citizens, 5G can help. If you want to have a smarter manufacturing floor, factory floor with you know equipment, automation and so on, can 5G makes a difference? And I can go on like that. So the key point is 5G has the potential to make our work more efficient and productive. It has the potential to make our lives much better in terms of the services we receive and enjoy. But it needs work because it's a new technology and it is something where we are working with the industry now to curate the solutions because this is the key thing. And so whilst we work on the supply side, on the infrastructure, we're working on the demand side with the companies. So PSA is working, for example, with some of the telcos because the new PSA port can have almost complete automation of the AGVs. So imagine the, the workers will now be controlling these automatic vehicles, automated vehicles from remote locations. But to do that, you need the 5G technology. 5G technology, like you said, you're, you're brainstorming the solutions that come with it and the issues too. Uh, and that also has to do with cyber security. Your colleague, Sim Ann, who is Senior Minister of State for Communications and Information, she said more women are needed in the cyber security arena to meet the high industry demand. What's the current proportion of women working in cyber security? I don't have an exact number for you, but I would say that, uh, you know, globally, the averages, if you if you look at some of the data, it's around 10 to 20 or so percent. And I don't think Singapore is very different from that. The real question is, uh, you know, can we have more women in cybersecurity and, for that matter, in the broader ICT space? And the answer is absolutely yes. And there's absolutely no reason why more women cannot be in this sector. And if you look at it from a, you know just a larger industry point of view, uh, you know, half the population are women and we should be making sure we are bringing women into this very exciting and promising space just as much as the men. So I think the potential is there we're already seeing a, 
a good uptick in the enrollment in the university, for example, for the comm science program and so on. So the enrollment has increased overall uh, in terms of total enrollment in the courses like in NUS and so on. And the dean was telling me that the proportion of women has also gone up significantly and so on. So that's a good sign. But we need to do no more, you know, we need to reach up. So, you know, talking to, say, students in secondary school, girls and boys, to say, look, this is the kind of thing, this is an exciting opportunity and, you know, you should consider this seriously. And then I think, you know, at the appropriate junctures when they're making decisions, whether it is in, you know, A-levels or polytechnic or going to university and so on, again, to create that, that, mindset that this is not something just for boys or for the men but actually all of us can do this the israelis do this very well and you know they're able to uh bring a lot more women into the the cyber domain i want to come back to 5g are you concerned at all that there could be two different systems when it comes to 5g in the future you mean in terms of the technology and the standards because of... Yeah, I'm wondering whether China could have uh, one sort of system and the US and Europe could have another 5G network going. Well, I think your question is basically touching on a much broader issue about the US-China and, and you know, on the technology space and whether there will be a what the people call a bifurcation, meaning the, the two systems pull apart and they don't talk to each other. I think nobody wants that. Uh, certainly not third countries like Singapore and so on, but I think even the Americans and the Chinese would not want that because the whole advantage of the technology uh, is when you can communicate and interoperate. Because the more you fragment, uh, the value proposition is lost. You know, because for technology is is what the economists call increasing returns to scale. The larger the the, the plate with which you can work, the better. So if you think back, I think some of your listeners may remember a time when we used to have GSM and CDMA uh, for the mobile phone. And you have to use a different phone when you go to Japan because they were using CDMA and then we used GSM phones and things like that. And it's just cumbersome and clunky and it just gets in the way. So you want to actually have the systems talking to each other and working together. So whether it can happen, well, that's not within our control. But I think many countries and even the companies who are involved in the space, they want to try and ensure that. And you've got to balance that with all the other considerations. But from Singapore's point of view, we want to be able to accommodate the technologies and we want the best technologies and we want them to be able to operate seamlessly with what is being used in the rest of the world as well. Now, let's talk about equipping Singaporeans to be digitally ready. We more or less have talked about that, but we want to go more into it. Minister, we've been talking a, a lot about preparing for disruption, mm. uh, disrupted world, industry 4.0. What are the key emerging jobs we're going to see more of in the future? Well, I think uh, in the areas, as I said, relating to then the more technology-oriented areas would be like artificial intelligence, uh, data analytics, uh, things that are involved with 5G technology, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, you know, where you're connecting devices and how do you optimize that and so on. And also a new interesting area is what they call data protection because there are concerns around data protection. So you need what they call data protection officers. And this is a combination of understanding the technology, your legal obligations and the policy environment, and you know, and this is a very important role that uh, for many companies. So there are many interesting new jobs that are being created, and as I mentioned earlier, I think in even the existing industries, uh, there's now a, an interesting new dimension with the digital side. So some of the companies have a multidisciplinary teams that are doing the marketing. Like when you talk about eleven eleven, the entire effort is one day long. And there's an incredible uh, collaborative effort between the tech guys, the marketing people, the creative people, the product people, the logistics fulfillment side, and they all come together to make it happen. So it's a very dynamic environment and people shouldn't have the impression that it's only about tech. It requires some tech knowledge, but actually all of us have the opportunity to participate. And in esports as well, there is a huge a ecosystem around in, uh, surrounding that. Indeed. So eSports is a very exciting new area. And, you know, I must confess, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I've been to some of these and I find it quite interesting because there are these uh, people behind the terminals 
you know, zipping away and then I see the big screen. Well, they are being nimble. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I, I, you know, it's, I think I'd rather watch a soccer match <laughs> personally, <laughs> but, but it makes, you know, but, but it, uh, it's a very important area and uh, we are supporting it. We are very keen on, you know, promoting it because I can sense the buzz and the excitement and it's a growing movement globally. And we've got some very strong uh, talent and companies in the space. So we want to support that. So it may not be everybody's cup of tea, but nevertheless, it should be on the menu. So you've got yeah. younger people who are embracing digital transformation. How about the older people in Singapore? Do you think they're embracing it as much as uh, they should? So this is the part that I think is most important when we talk about digital inclusivity, in my view. And I find this the most uh, gratifying part of the work we're doing as well in some ways. Because... When you're doing the work with the companies, with the workers and so on, in a way, there's an economic imperative. But it's the work that we do with older Singaporeans, for example. Let's take seniors. So we have, you know, they call them silver infocom junctions uh, where uh, older Singaporeans can obtain uh, advice and help on how to use uh, digital technologies. We also have these digital clinics. And I found this particularly inspiring when I see young students from ITE or Polytechnic uh, sitting there one-on-one -on -one with somebody who is maybe 70 years old and they're talking about, okay, so how do I now use this, uh, you know, YouTube or, you know, and so YouTube is always very popular because it's a great way to watch videos, right? So I tell the guys... Yeah, start with things people really want to do. Don't go and start by teaching them how to pay fines or pay their bills because it's not the most inspiring or attractive. But having said that, they get into it very quickly. So, you know, and they're starting to find out how do I search for information? How do I get access to news? And how do I do this? So I think that to me is a very gratifying part because you see, we want all Singaporeans to feel connected, not feel isolated by this digital transition, you see. It's also an empowerment, isn't it? Absolutely. So it's empowering for individuals because now I can find information from wherever really and so on. It's empowering for the worker because obviously now I can do different things. And, you know, even older workers, right? Because when you have technology now assisting you, people can actually, you know, because it's a lot of it is about what's our knowledge and our skills and it makes a big difference. It's also very empowering for businesses because now you think about it, small business, right? Last time, I have to grow in my domestic market before I can sell overseas, before I can partner with somebody from overseas and so on. Now, I can be a very small company in Singapore or in, you know, Samarang in Indonesia, but I can now through the digital platform, sell to any corner in the world, partner with people from around the world and access all kinds of services. So I think it's very empowering and the, I, I think it democratizes the economy because now what used to be only available to big companies is now available to small businesses and it enables workers to punch well above their weight in terms of the skills that they have. Let's go back to cybersecurity and uh, our our us in general. We are of of course we know that we are the one of the most connected nations in the world. But in your travels and in the many uh, meetings and conferences that you go to and the businesses that you speak to and its people as well, how vulnerable is Singapore when it comes to cybersecurity lapses? I think we are. You know, uh, there's two sides to this. The first is the more connected you are, the, the smarter the nation is, as it were, in terms of using digital technologies and connectedness and so on, the more exposed you are because that's uh, the other side of the coin, right? And uh, whoever has uh, bad intent can then try and exploit that. But we shouldn't let that deter us from doing these things because they bring big benefits. In healthcare, if I can bring the data together, it helps the doctor deliver a much better service to the patient. And that's what we want. And we shouldn't let these sorts of concerns or threats hamper that. But what it means is we must invest in the cybersecurity part because that's what undergirds the, the digital economy. And if you want to proceed with confidence and for people to feel confident about it, this is critical. So that's why we invest a lot of effort at the national level uh, you know, in terms of our cybersecurity for our what we call the critical information infrastructure systems, you know, uh, in, in telecoms and in banking and, and so on, healthcare and so on. But 
I think the other important part is what companies do and individuals do. Because it's not just about government doing it and proposing and everybody else uh, doesn't. Everybody has a role to play. And I think this is a key part of the thing. And for example, for us as individuals, right, uh, strong passwords and two-factor authentication. I mean, if I had a penny for everyone, somebody who tells me that they think, you know, 8888 or 12345678 is a good password. I mean, you know, but password no longer... Password is their password. Uh, the word password is password, their password. You know. So, but I think now that's changed. Uh, I can sense that it's a bit different and so on. But, you know, it's beyond that as well. It's also, do you keep antivirus software? Do you update the software? Do you do things? These are very simple hygiene things. You know, in the physical world, we are quite careful, right? In terms of our security for our home, you take precautions when you go out or whatever and things, especially when you're in an area you're unfamiliar. Well, the cyber world is the same thing. And we should just do sensible things. Since you mentioned homes, uh, we see families sometimes when they're outside and each family member, young and old, they're on their mobile devices. Yeah. There's very little communication. Does that worry you at all that everyone's just hooked on to uh, yeah. Wi-Fi or the internet and yeah. they're not really communicating as a family or yeah. as people? So sometimes when my wife or my family, we go out to a restaurant and we see people all on the sitting around the table on their phones, well, sometimes I joke, they're probably talking to each other just on WhatsApp. And so I, well, you know, I think uh, we all have to adjust uh, to this new case. I mean, if you think about it in one way, all this new social media and other devices actually are enabling us to keep in contact with so many more people than we were ever able to. Family, friends, overseas and so on, and you keep updated. So that's that's a great part of it. But I think we just have to keep it in perspective. Uh, and I think there are a lot of work and literature and research being done on, you know, the impact it has on the kind of relationship. So making sure that, you know, we ensure, because, you know, human beings at the end of the day, we are social. And, you know, and the connections that we have by talking face to face, you know, a doctor talking to a patient uh, is very different to a doctor WhatsApping a patient. And, you know, it's and that whole, what they call the psychosoma, right? Your mental well-being has an impact on your physical well-being and vice versa. I think that's very important. And a lot of that comes from the interaction that you have and so on. So I think we need to find a healthy balance. Uh, and I think everybody has to find the balance that works for them. Have you found one with your family? Uh, yes, but it's a work in progress because, uh, you know, uh, uh, without getting into detail, some members would like to go more in one direction, others would like to stay in the other direction. So it's a, it's a dynamic balance and we keep having to discuss and deal with it. We'll ask you to expand on that later after the <laughs> interview. But with, with a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of use of our mobile phones and the internet and connected digitally to all of these devices comes cyberbullying. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's been in the headlines lately uh, with the unfortunate death of the K-pop uh, K-pop star Soli, who's believed to have committed suicide. She was a target of online hate and abuse and she suffered from severe depression. Um, and it's definite, we're definite that our children and our youth go yes. through the same thing. Yeah. What can we do to create a safer internet for our children when yeah. they're growing so up? So I think that example you said is so tragic. And, you know, this is someone who's successful, a young person who has everything to look forward to. And then, you know, they end up, you know, with this very tragic outcome. So I think this is where I don't think there's one solution. We have to work at it collectively because it's not about keeping our young people away from social media and so on because it is part and parcel of our lives. And it's also something where I think they will want to use it and they don't want to be isolated. So it really comes down to how well equipped are we as individuals you know, how do we teach our or share with our young people to use the internet for good? You know, so like the Media Literacy Council talks about be kind on the internet, right? And that sort of thing. So that's one side of it. I think parents have a responsibility. Schools are involved in different ways. You know, it's not just about teaching you how to code, but it's also about how you use these devices. The National Library Board has this pro uh, effort, they call it SURE, S-U-R-E, Source, Understand, Research, Evaluate. And that again is about understanding that what you read, is it real? Is it fake? And how do I use it? And how do you assess it before you liberally share it? And so on. So I think this is what it comes down to. It's a, it's, I think, a learning process for all of us. 
and we need to support our, you know, especially younger people. But in fact, even for older people, sometimes it can be quite challenging because social media is, can be a real force for good, but it can also sometimes unleash some very negative behavior. And we have to make sure that we're able to contain the, the downside whilst allowing the upside to flourish. Also with uh, technology, do you see that making soft skills even more important? Technology, well, yes, because I the emphasis, you see, the more technology we use, right, a lot more of the mundane stuff will get done by machines and, and, and algorithms and so on and so forth. But the part that is irreducible and irreplaceable is the human factor, you see, and the, what some people call the empathic element. In other words, you know, you can do all the analysis, but at the end of the day, I'm talking to you or you're talking to me and, you know, that that element is key in people making decisions. You know, as for example, if you're a patient, do you want to be advised on the medication you take by a machine or some kind of avatar? Or do you want to talk to a real doctor who you trust, whom you have a relationship with? And you can say the same thing again about a whole range of other things. So the soft skills therefore become even more important because that's where we differentiate ourselves and the innate humanness of who we are and the way we interact makes a difference. So I think that's going to be key, our ability to communicate, to persuade, to understand, to empathize in whatever discipline we are in. Uh, I think that's going to be important. But the good thing is, of course, the less mundane things we have to do, the more we can really apply ourselves to this area and make a difference. I think the soft skills and uh, not being replaced by an avatar is, is very applicable to people like Lance and I. I don't think news readers can be ever replaced <laughs> by an avatar, although this is happening in China. Well, they're trying. I've seen yeah. it, uh, you know, and I asked some people for their reaction. They still prefer the real person. <laughs> Because, We're safe but you know, it's iterating. I hope so. <laughs> as long as we know it's not an avatar that they're saying is real too. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Yeah. Deep fake. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, we're speaking to Mr. S. Iswaran, Minister for Communications and Information. And uh, we're talking about Singapore's push to becoming a smart nation and what this means for Singaporeans. We wanna, uh, we've want we got about five minutes left, so maybe we can get a bit more personal with Mr. S. Iswaran. What do you think? What do you think, Minister? <laughs> oh, with great trepidation. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let's start with, uh, since uh, we're here at Mediacorp and uh, there are lots of music stations uh, next to us, uh, do you have a, a favourite genre of music, sir? Uh, I'm quite omnivorous in my diet for music. I listen, uh, how much should I get into? Okay, never mind. So I do listen to a wide range of music because I was brought up, uh, because my father was into music and I listened to a range. So I listened to rock, I listened to jazz, I listened to... Uh, classical, both uh, Western and uh, Indian classical. Mm -hmm. And I've also been known to listen to some Chinese jazz, you know, and so on. So it's quite diverse. So if you're going to ask me which station I tune into, I tune into a variety of stations depending on my mood and so on. But uh, I think, you know, music is a very good uh, a mood complement. So it depends on your mood and what you're looking for and so on. Yeah. Off the top of your head, what would be your three favorite songs? Three favorite songs? Yeah. Well, this is a tough it's one. It's very right? tough. It's one of it's the toughest one. questions you know, you've received. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I was just uh, thinking about it the other day. And, uh, you know, uh, there's the Elvis Presley one, which uh, oh. my wife and I like, uh, which is, uh, you know, Love Me Tender and so on. So <clears throat> that's one. And then uh, I, I actually like uh, some of Ed Sheeran's more uh, recent work. He's wow. a very good, you know, I think he's a very good songwriter mm. and he's got some very good. So, of course, people will say Shape of You and so on. But the one I like is Perfect, I think it is. Ah, uh, that's yes. a very nice one song. and so on. It's a beautiful yes. song. And uh, I like some of, uh, you know, it's very hard because actually trying to identify a few. But uh, the other artist that I quite enjoy listening to is uh, Adele. And she's got quite a range of songs that are very nice as well. So, actually, as I said, you can tell, you know, it's quite diverse, old, new and so on. And my 
children keep me honest in my taste in music as well. <laughs> we know you and your wife like going for uh, concerts as well. Will you be How going do you for know that? that? We've seen pictures of we okay. research. Oh dear. Okay, yeah, all right. Will you be going for the U2 concert? Absolutely. U2, of course, you know. I mean, uh, no, actually, uh, this is one of the concerts that I was hoping would come to Singapore. Uh, and I'm very glad that they are, and I think it will be a blast for you know for the YouTube fans and so on. Uh, but we've been to others as well, you know, Maroon Five and uh, and the Rolling Stones when they came and so on as well. So I think it should be a quite an interesting concert. Absolutely. What YouTube song would you be listening out to? Bearing in mind it's coming from the Joshua Tree album. Yes, indeed. So well, uh, still haven't found what, what I'm, I'm looking, looking for. for. Nice. That'll be, I think, a very good one. And uh, I think uh, With or Without You, yes. that's very good. And The Streets Have No Name. Beautiful. So this, anyway, that's a seminal album. So uh, it is. You, you can't go wrong. There's too many good songs in it. All killer, no filler. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zwaran, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on to uh, CNA 938 Singapore today. We were speaking to Mr. S. Zwaran, Minister for Communications and Information. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.